Hey everybody, welcome to the Mana League's second set review for Dragons of Tarkir. Today we're going to be looking at all of the blue cards. Uh, if you haven't listened to the first set review of white, there are three very important disclaimers uh, on this set review. Uh, I'm just going to rattle them off very quickly here. First off, I have not played with this set, I have not played with these cards, I have not printed them off and proxied them or anything like that. Um, so this is just sort of my... First impressions, just by looking at the card text and uh, knowing what I know about Fate Reforged and uh, magic in general. Uh, secondly, this is sort of my first impressions. This is how I'm going to approach the draft uh, that I'm going to be playing in two weeks at my store. This is how I'm going to be approaching pre-release that I'm going to be playing in a week at my store. Uh, and how I'm going to be approaching this the first couple of weeks. Uh, after some experience, some of these grades will very likely change. Some cards uh, always uh, appear much worse than they actually are uh, when you actually play with them. And some of them, of course, appear a lot better than they actually are when you play with them. So this is sort of a, uh, you know, first couple of weeks how I'm going to approach the set. And finally, these are just my opinions on these cards. Uh, if you disagree, that's fantastic. Uh, you know, listen to what I say about the card. Maybe you missed something. Or... Maybe I missed something. It's entirely likely. Um, you know, if you have a, a differing opinion on a card, you think I've grossly overrated or underrated something, you can definitely let me know in the comments. Um, you know, set reviews are not meant to be one person talking down from high uh, as to exactly how good the card is. It's meant to uh, fuel discussion. It's meant to, you know, really get people involved in thinking about these cards and uh, uh, getting all the information out that's possible. But we're going to jump right on into blue. Uh, and we've got the first card here. It is Ancient Carp. Yep, a big giant fish. Uh, it is a 4 and a blue 2-5 creature fish at common with no rules text. It is just a vanilla 2-5 five for 5. Um, <laughs> I don't want this fish. 2-5 uh, for 5 is just pretty crappy stats. Uh, or, or pretty carpy stats, I suppose. Um, I don't want to play this. Uh, as I've alluded to in the white set review, and I will apparently allude to in every single set review until we get to green, there's the potential for a Toughness Matters deck. Um, we know of Grim Contest from uh, Fate Reforged, where Toughness mattered, and there's some cards that uh, make Toughness matter a whole heck of a lot. And maybe this has a place in that deck. I don't know if that deck exists in any real competitive way. Um, so I'm going to be pretty cautious about that. Uh, but outside of that toughness deck, um, I just don't want this. I don't want a 2-5 five for 5. I want to be attacking. I, I want to be doing stuff. Um, you know, maybe in an uber-controlling deck this has a place, but even then it's a 5-drop. You know, you, you want blockers in a controlling deck that come down early, uh, not that come down on turn 5. On turn 5 you're hoping to... Uh, have emptied your opponent's hand or getting close to it and uh, getting ready to put your finisher down, um, ideally, uh, within the next few turns. So I gotta give this guy an F, unfortunately. Moving on, we have Anticipate. Anticipate is a one and a blue instant at common, and it says look at the top three cards of your library, put one of them into your hand, and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. Uh, so this card has a pretty easy comparison to Impulse, uh, a fairly old card. It was actually in FTV20. Um, Impulse was exactly this, except four cards. Um, this is a solid card. Impulse was fantastic. This is a ever so slightly fixed Impulse, but uh, you know this is this is just solid, solid, solid. Uh, you know, new players will, of course, say, well, what if I draw three great cards and I have to throw two of them away? It doesn't matter because you're still taking the best card of those three. Um, that's the same argument you sometimes have people uh, saying against looting. What if I draw something and I don't want to discard any of them? Well, there's always a worst card. Um, you know, you get to dig through the top three cards of your library at instant speed, so you can do this at the end of your opponent's turn. Uh, if you are a really controlling deck, you can try to dig to a counterspell in response to a bomb or something like that. Uh, this is just a, a really, really, really solid card to me for uh, tempo, for control, even for aggro. You know, it, it kind of refills your hand. Not a huge amount, just one single card. Uh, but ideally, that card is something that helps you further close the game down as aggro. Obviously, a little bit more better for tempo or control, but... 
you know, just fantastic. It's not a flashy card. It's not a bomb. It's not, you know, a card that's going to close the game right then and there. But it's going to get you there. It's going to get you to those cards that do that. Uh, so this is a solid uh, mid-pack pick, maybe even slightly higher than that if you really love tempo or control or, or, or what blue often does. So I've got to go with B- minus on this. It's, it's just a solid card. I'm really excited to include these in uh, probably any blue deck I play. Next up, we have Bell Toll Dragon. This is a 5 and a blue, uncommon 3-3 three, three creature dragon. Uh, this is of the same cycle as, uh, what was the white one? Shield Hide Dragon. So this has Flying and Hexproof. It has Megamorph, 5 blue blue. And it says exactly the same thing as Shield Hide Dragon. When Beltold Dragon is turned face up, put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on each other dragon creature you control. I don't really care for this dragon either. Um, you know, it, it's a 6 drop for a 3-3 three, three flyer with Hexproof. Hexproof is okay on a flyer, you know. Um, it's not the best. You can still block it and kill it with a lot of stuff in this format. People do tend to overvalue Hexproof slightly. Uh, it, it's probably one of my most hated mechanics to see on the other side of the board. I, I just I hate playing against it because you can't interact with it. But you can interact with it in limited, especially because you're playing creatures. You're smashing creatures into each other. You're not playing, you know, ten counter spells and a bunch of removal. You're playing a few pieces of removal. And probably not even, a, well, counters, of course. Well, cancel it, hexproof. But anyways, you're interacting with this guy through combat. And combat, this guy dies pretty easily. If your opponent wants to go you know, full-on paying the 5 blue blue Megamorph cost to make it a 4-4, four, four. you still probably have a fair number of ways to just knock this out of the skies through combat. Uh, and again, as I talked about with the white one, I don't know if the ability, the turn faced up ability is going to do anything. Um, it's just a bit of a spoiler alert. I don't really care for any of these Megamorph dragons. I think they are... Uh, at worst, super cuttable. <laughs> or, sorry, probably at best, super cuttable. Um, I don't really ever want to play these. And that knocks out half of the uncommon dragons right then and there. Uh, the other five uncommons are in gold. And so that means that I don't think that despite this being dragons of Tarkir, I don't think that you personally are going to have a whole bunch of dragons in your deck in order to really get any value out of this. And of course, if you do have a whole bunch of dragons in your deck, you're not doing anything until turn 5, 6, 7, uh, and you might just get run over by then. So I don't think that this cycle has much playability at all, unfortunately. So i got to give this guy a D+, plus, um, which is ever so slightly below where I would normally put totally cuttable. Um, so I think it's even slightly worse than that. So D plus for that. Next up, we have Blessed Reincarnation. This is three and a blue instant at rare, and it says exile target creature and opponent controls. That player reveals cards from the top of his or her library until a creature is revealed. That player puts that card onto the battlefield, then shuffles the rest into his or her library. And rebound. So you get to kill something and then your opponent gets whatever the next creature is uh, on top of their deck or, or some number of cards through the top of their deck. Uh, this is really interesting. It's, it's basically non-premium bomb removal. It's kind of the way you want to use it. Um, you know, any given deck will generally have a bomb in it. Uh, if you're really lucky, you might have a couple of bombs in your deck. But most of your deck is going to be, you know, one drops, two drops, three drops, four drops. Stuff that's just there to get in the early damage, maybe get in the late damage, or maybe go wide, whatever. Um, so hitting their bomb with this spell is basically a guaranteed downgrade. Uh, you're guaranteed to turn that bomb into something that is worse. Uh, using this on a smaller creature is a bit risky. You know, you don't want to blow up their Sultai Emissary uh, and then give them, you know, a Tarka. That would be a strange color combination deck to be playing, but you don't want to be doing that. Um, you want to be hitting their bomb with this. You want to be hitting something that's really serious that needs to die now um, and that you'll probably get a downgrade out of it. Uh, the rebound's interesting here, too. 
Um, I feel like there's going to be a number of cases where they'll have a bomb and maybe a couple of other creatures. All blessed reincarnation, the bomb downgraded into something kind of crappy and then not want to rebound again. I won't want to recast this because I, I don't want to risk hitting maybe another bomb. You know, I, I, I could go to the next best creature on the board, but say that's a 3-3 or a 4-4. Four, four. And then I hit another three three or another four four and I, I get nothing out of it. I do nothing out of it. I, I I don't necessarily want to do the risk of rebounding this. Um uh, but even without the rebound, this just seems pretty good. It seems like solid uh kind of bomb removal. Feels a little bit better than reality shift to me, honestly. Um reality shift of course gives you the, the manifest creature, which means that at least you know what you're getting, you know you're ma- turning it into a two two. Um, but I, I, I just I kind of like this to uh, be saved up, used as bomb removal, give them something bad. Um, it, it's going to make some pretty feel-bad uh, uh, scenarios where you drop your big bomb, you feel confident, and suddenly it's a 1-1 or whatever was on top of your deck. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sold on the rebound on this. Maybe it'll be okay. Um, obviously, it'll be okay if there's two bombs sitting on your uh, opponent's battlefield or something like that, but... Uh, at least for the first bomb, this seems pretty solid to me, so I do give this a B. Next up, we have Clone Legion. Clone Legion is a 7 blue blue sorcery at Mythic. So we've got a 9 drop here. Uh, for each creature target player controls, put a token onto the battlefield that's a copy of that creature. So you basically look at your battlefield, or you look at your opponent's battlefield, and you say, I want a copy of everything that's there. And you get a copy of everything that's there. Uh, at a 9-drop, in limited, this is garbage. It's hilarious. It's going to be really fun in Commander. Uh, I may throw a copy in my cube, although I doubt it would ever get played. Um, but limited, it, it's a flat-out F. It's an F-. minus. You, you're not going to play this. You're not going to play 9-drops. Um, just don't try to do this. Um, you're going to be very sad when this just sits in your hand and you never really get to 9 mana. Um, absolute F- minus for sure. Uh, that being said, I'm excited to play this on the uh, uh, the Wacky Wednesday Rare Draft that I will inevitably do for this set. Alright, next up is Contradict. This is 3 blue blue for an instant at common, and it says counter target spell. Draw a card. So this is uh, this is our counter spell for the set, or, or one of our counter spells for the set, um, and it's <laughs> it's expensive. Uh, five mana is a little bit too rich for my blood for a counter spell. Um, it takes a very special counter to be main deckable in limited, anyways. Um, Dissolve, for example, totally main deckable. Uh, three mana plus scry was great. Um, dissipate, of course, um, but then you change that ever so slightly to cancel which is Dissolve, less the Scry, and it goes from being main deckable to barely even sideboardable. Um, you know, knocking this up to 5 mana, 3 blue blue, and giving us draw a card doesn't really fit in the main deck. You know, you, you could try to shoehorn this into a super controlling deck, um, or it could be a desperate sideboard maneuver, but uh, not main deckable in the slightest, and probably not even really usable I would have to say so I've got to give this a D minus next up is Dance of the Skywise this is one in a blue instant at uncommon and it says until end of turn target creature you control becomes a blue dragon illusion with base power and toughness 4-4 loses all abilities and gains flying um, this is interesting to say the least it uh it seems like a fun combat trick on defense, so your opponent attacks in, and you've got a 2-2 on the ground, and suddenly, surprise, it's a 4-4 flying dragon. Um, it could also be a good way to punch through damage on offense, uh, you know, turn your guy into a flying 4-4 dragon, your opponent has no flyers, and get in for some damage. Um, you know, it, it, it seems interesting. It, it seems like a, a kind of middling to almost solid combat trick to me. Um, very, very important. Make sure you read that line that says loses all abilities. So, uh, you know, you, you don't get to keep your uh, creature's abilities or activated abilities or, or death touch or lifelink or whatever they might have. They are going to become just a blue, blue flying dragon and absolutely nothing else. So uh, 
you know, I, I think it's includable if, if this is what you're in the market for. Um, otherwise, I think it's cuttable. So, you know, kind of a solid, just straight up C for me. Next up, we have Durger Nemesis. I'm not sure what Durger is. Uh, this is five and a blue for a 6 5 creature serpent at common. Uh, 6 5 for 6 sounds pretty big. What does it do? Well, it has Defender, so it's not going anywhere. Uh, and it's got Megamorph for 6 and a blue. If you really want to pay 7, you can get a 7 6 out of this. Um, just like the fish, just like the ancient carp, I'm going to pass on this. Um, it's significantly larger than the fish, but it's got Defender, which means it's not attacking. It's just going to sit there and block. Now, the Toughness Matters deck is uh, also kind of the Defenders Matter deck. Um, and we'll talk about that when we get to this this mythical green... It's not mythic, it's just a rare. But this uh, green rare that enables this entire deck archetype that may or may not function um, but outside of that singular deck I don't ever want to see this card I don't want to ever take it I don't want to ever play it um, you know this is another kind of skill tester for new players I think they'll see a big creature like this and they'll see it has defender and they'll they'll understand that they can't attack with it but they'll think wow I can just block everything that comes at me but that's not how you win a game of magic you don't win a game of magic by blocking you win a game of magic by attacking you win a game of magic by you know, killing your opponent off. So uh, a, a six-five defender just doesn't do that. It just doesn't do anything for you. So I, I've got to give this just a solid F. Um, again, if the toughness matters, defender can attack deck happens or is a thing. Maybe this hap maybe this works. Maybe something happens, but uh, I've got to say no. And uh, yeah, it's just not for me. I, I've got to go with the uh, the solid F. Next up, we have Dragon Lord's Prerogative. This is four blue blue for an instant at rare, and it says, as an additional cost to cast Dragon Lord's Prerogative, you may reveal a dragon card from your hand. If you revealed a dragon card or controlled a dragon as you cast Dragon Lord's Prerogative, Dragon Lord's Prerogative can't be countered. Draw four cards. That was a lot of Dragon Lords and Dragons. Um, so yeah, basically this is draw four cards for uh, six. If you reveal a dragon, if you happen to have a dragon, this can't be countered, which does not matter in limited. You know, it, the cannot be countered clause, for all intents and purposes, doesn't matter. Yeah, you're going to get countered here and there. It's almost rarely going to be the correct move for your opponent to have main decked that counter. Maybe it's game two or game three, they sided it in. And if they're countering your draw four cards spell... You know, it, it's a decent play, but it's still not the worst play. So the, the cannot be countered clause just doesn't really matter for limited here. Uh, it's obviously significantly more important in a constructed format. So anyways, we're basically talking about draw four cards for six, which is, of course, opportunity. Uh, an opportunity used to be used to be a com or sorry, an uncommon, and now we're up to rare just because we get the the situational cannot be countered clause. Um, now, opportunity was one of the better spells in M14 Limited, but M14 Limited was a little bit wonky. Uh, M14, you could literally just draft blue and win uh, all the time. Um, I don't know if opportunity is going to be as good in this format. I, I really need to see the speed of the format. Um, it looks like it could be slowing down from what we've seen, but if it doesn't, or if it doesn't slow down very much, then I don't think this card is all that great. It's definitely not M14 level, I don't think, uh, of quality. If it does slow down quite a lot, then this spell definitely bumps up a little bit more. Um, but I'm going to go with C plus here. I, I don't think we're going to be slowing down to such a you know, super glacial pace that Dragon Lord's Prerogative is going to be an awesome card especially for it being at rare. So I've got to go with C+. I'll take it if it's still there, pick 5, pick 6, and I think I might go blue. Because drawing 4 cards is awesome. Drawing car 4 cards at instant speed for 6 is totally worth it. Um, but you've got to get there. You've got to get to 6, and you, uh, you know, oftentimes would probably just want to be dropping a 6-drop bomb. But, you know, C+, seems okay, seems fine. Uh, really depends on the speed of the format. So this grade is... Definitely up for uh, changing after uh, I get some experience. 
Next up is Elusive Spell Fist. This is a 1 in a blue, 1 3, creature human monk at common. And it says whenever you cast a non creature spell, so fake prowess, Elusive Spell Fist gets plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn and can't be blocked this turn. So you get yourself a, a, an impersonation of Mystic of the Hidden Way, kind of. So 1 3. Cast a non-creature spell, it becomes a 2-4, and it cannot be blocked this turn. Uh, and I've got to pass on this. Um, it, it sounds cool. You know, I get to play all my non-creature spells, and all my non-creature spells get uh, tacked onto it. This creature gets plus 1, plus 0, and is unblockable. That sounds pretty cool, but, you know, this is my whole prowess and fake prowess uh, rant, that there's not that many non-creature spells you play. And... Most of them want to be played at very specific times. They're going to be removal that ideally is going to be at the end of your opponent's turn or beginning of combat or, or something like that. And so the spells that are going to make this guy unblockable, to use that, you're going to need to be playing them in your main phase, in your upkeep, at your beginning of combat even. You're not going to be playing your combat tricks in combat, and that's awful. You know, you're going to have to play your removal on your turn, you're just going to have to make really suboptimal non-creature spell plays to get this guy going. And, you know, arguably at best, he's going to be a 2-3 unblockable. You know, it's very unlikely you're going to go non-creature spell, non-creature spell, non-creature spell, attack for, you know, four once, and you've already wasted three cards. Um, overall, this feels just kind of like Jess Guy's student to me. Uh, maybe because it's the the one three for two that I'm not a big fan of. Um, I'm never really going to be happy main decking this, I don't think. Uh, I'm not going to be looking to take it, uh, and I don't really ever want to play this, so I've got to give it a D-. minus. Next up, we have Encase in Ice. Encase in Ice is a one and a blue enchantment aura at Uncommon. And it says Flash, so you can cast it whenever you want. Uh, enchant red or green creature. So this is the blue color hoser. When in case an ice enters the battlefield, tap enchanted creature. Enchanted creature doesn't on tap during its controller's on tap step. So this is a, you know, absolutely right out of the gate sideboard card. You're not going to main deck this because you're not going to be playing against red-green decks all the time. You're not going to be playing against red or green decks all the time. Um, so you don't want to main deck this. Um, that being said, if you're playing against red-green, this is a solid card to sideboard in. I would sideboard this in every single time. It's pretty darn solid removal. Yeah, they could have enchantment destruction or something, but other than that, it's fantastic removal. It, it can immediately shut off aggro. It can turn off their bomb late in the game. Um, totally fine with this card uh, going up against a red-green deck. Pretty fine, just like with the white one. I'm pretty okay with siding it in against a red or a green deck uh, that are paired with other colors, depending on the, the density of threats in those two colors. It's a low pick, obviously. You're going to be taking this, you know, 7th, 8th, ninth, 12th pick. It's going to be the card that you take when you think you're in blue and there's just nothing else in the pack for you and you take it, throw it in the sideboard, and maybe you get some value out of it in the tournament. Um, but, you know, i got to go with D+, just straight up sideboard card. Don't main deck this, uh, but side it in and be pretty happy when you, uh, when you need it. Next up is Glint. Glint is one in a blue instant at common, and it says target creature you control gets plus zero, plus three, and gains hexproof until end of turn. So this spell basically just says your creature gets hexproof until end of turn. Um, the toughness boost isn't remotely as important as the hexproof. Um, you're going to use this to stop removal. Your opponent's going to cast Reach of Shadows, and you're going to say, ah, uh, uh, hexproof. Um, sometimes the toughness boost will be usable to stop a trade in combat or something like that, um, but that's definitely a weaker way of using this card. You want to use this card to stop removal. You want to use this card to stop um, your creature being targeted with something. It seems includable if you want it and cuttable if you don't. Maybe mildly sideboardable if you're coming up against a deck that has a, an inordinate amount of removal. Um, just a, a solid C to me. It's going to make it sometimes. It's not going to make it other times. And uh, yeah, that's about all there is to say about that one. Um, just yeah, make sure you do use that for uh, stopping removal for fizzling spells. Make sure you're not using that primarily for the toughness boost. 
Next up, we have Gadul Lurker. This costs a single blue for a 1 1 creature salamander at uncommon. So a 1 1 for 1. It says Gadul Lurker can't be blocked. 1 1 unblockable for 1. Still awful. But it says also Megamorph for a single blue as well. So this sounds pretty good from the uh, from the get go. It sounds like it's a two two unblockable for one with Megamorph, but uh, you know, make sure that you really sort of walk through what it takes to get there. Uh, this is a three drop that you then turn up on turn four, and you get a two two unblockable. That's a pale comparison to Mystic of the Hidden Way. Uh, Mystic of the Hidden Way would have been a three two unblockable in the exact same amount of time. So this is definitely a downgrade from Mystic of the Hidden Way, which was an awesome solid card. Um, and a downgrade from an awesome solid card is still a decent card. Um, I'm ready to be surprised by this guy being more powerful than I'm giving him credit for, um, but already I'm going to happily include him in nearly any blue deck I play. Um, but I'm not super sold on him just yet. Um, maybe I'm just dreaming of the days of Mystic of the Hidden Way and how sad it will be that it's gone and this is what we have now and it, it may still be just as good um, but I think losing that one toughness uh, making it a 2-2 is going to make it a little bit slower um, and so I don't know if that's going to be as good. Uh, Meringue River Prowler for example was pretty solid but arguably the worst part of it was the fact that it just kept coming back. This guy you hit him with a shock, and he's just dead for good. And so I'm only going to give him a C+. Plus. Um, he's totally playable, but I don't think he's quite on the level of Mystic or uh, Meringue River Prowler, which were definitely more in the B range. Um, so yeah, i, I got to give this guy a C+. Plus. I'm ready to be surprised by him, but C+, plus for me, for the uh, first week at least. Next up, we have Gurmog Drowner. This is a 3 and a blue 2-4 creature Naga wizard at common. And it says exploit. This is our first exploit card. This is a new mechanic for the uh, Silumgar brood. And exploit says when this creature enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice a creature. So you can sacrifice another creature, or you can sacrifice itself, uh, essentially turning exploit into uh, uh, evoke. So this has more rules text. Exploit always does something. So when Gurmog Drowner exploits a creature, look at the top four cards of your library. Put one of them into your hand and the rest into your graveyard. So when you cast this guy, you can sack another creature or itself and draw four cards. Or sorry, not draw four cards. That'd be awesome. You can look at the top four cards of your library, take one, and throw the rest away. Um... This seems like a fairly weak exploit. There's definitely exploits um, that we're going to see later that I'm pretty sold on. Um, but this one just doesn't seem quite as good. You're sacking a creature. You're throwing away board presence to gamble on the top four cards having something better than the creature that you sacked. Sometimes, absolutely, you're going to have that little crappy two drop still in the game and it's going to be doing nothing for you, and it's going to be better to turn it into looking at the top four cards and taking the best one. But I don't know how often that's going to happen, and so this does feel like a little bit of a weak trade-off to me. Um, I, I would also never really want to exploit this guy himself. Um, I, I would prefer probably a 2-4 over looking at the top four cards and taking the best one. Um, I, I'm going to be a little bit cautious with this, uh, but I think Exploit is going to be manifest for me in this set. It's going to be a mechanic that I really need to play with to get a good feel of uh, exactly what's going on there. Uh, but I'm going to start off cautious with this guy and give him a C-. I just feel like it's a bit of a weak um, trade-off for the Exploit here. Next up we have Icefall Regent. This is the blue rare dragon. Uh, three blue blue for a 4-3 creature dragon at rare. And it has flying, of course. And it says, when Icefall Regent enters the battlefield, tap target creature an opponent controls. That creature doesn't untap during its controller's untap step for as long as you control Icefall, Re Icefall Regent. Also, spells your opponent's cast that target Icefall Regent cost two more to cast. So Dungeon Geist was an absolutely awesome card in Dark Ascension. A uh, total first pick. And it was this card 
without the uh, the frost giant or frost titan ability um, for one less, and it was a three three flyer. So that you pay one more, and you get an extra toughness, and the creature is really resilient. You know, targeting it with removal is going to cost your opponent two extra mana, which hopefully uh, makes this guy stick around just a little bit longer. This seems like a really solid first pick to me. Um, you know, it really works in all stages of the game that you can cast it. If you're behind, if you're ahead, if you're stalled, it just seems like it's a card that really, really, really will let you uh, get in control of the game. Um, very quick note, this isn't quite Frost Titan's ability. Uh, abilities can still target Icefall Regent for their normal cost. It's just stopping spells. Um, probably won't come up all that often, but something to keep in mind. Um, but yeah, this is a solid A to me. This is, this is first pickable. Uh, absolutely take it. Start going into blue right away. Uh, just seems like a solid, solid, solid card to me. Next up, we have Illusory Gains. This is three blue blue for an enchantment aura at rare, and it says enchant creature. You control enchanted creature. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under an opponent's control, attach Illusory Gains to that creature. So this is going to be bouncing around, and uh, I think it seems pretty damn bad. Um, the ideal play, I guess, would be that you mind control something of your opponent's board before they've played their bomb and then they don't want to play their bomb because you'll get it but that's a really 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 weak reason to play this because your opponent can very easily just draw their bomb wait until they draw a crappy creature play their bomb yeah you get it and then they play the crappy creature and you get the crappy creature uh far 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 too much control is being given to your opponent with this card. Your opponent gets to decide exactly what's going on with this card, and that's not something you ever want to do. Uh, this is a straight-up solid F for me. Um, I, I'm not going to take this card, I'm not going to play this card, and I'm going to love seeing it on the other side of the battlefield, because um, I will really punish my opponent um, by forcing them to end up with a, a bad creature. Yeah, solid F for me. So next up, we have Learn from the Past. Learn from the past is a three and a blue instant at uncommon, and it says target player shuffles his or her graveyard into his or her library, draw a card. So probably you get to put your graveyard back into your library, and then you get to draw a card off of it. Um, doesn't really seem playable to me in uh, limited. Seems more like a constructed card or a, uh, an anti-mill card if somebody's playing mill. Um, you know, maybe the most grindy controlling decks that expect to go through the majority of their library would want this um, to, you know, A, get their cards back so that they don't deck themselves, and B, get their counters back and their removal back and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, in almost all cases, I want to be winning the game long before I'd ever want to consider doing that. So I've got to give this an F as well. I just, I, I don't think it's playable in limited, so not taking it. Not playing it. Solid F. Next up is Living Lore. This is a three and a blue star star creature avatar at rare. So as Living Lore enters the battlefield, exile an instant or sorcery from your graveyard. Living Lore's power and toughness are each equal to the exiled card's converted mana cost. Whenever Living Lore deals combat damage, you may sacrifice it. If you do, you may cast the exiled card without paying its mana cost. So what don't we play in limited? Super expensive instants and sorceries. We don't play the, uh, the clone army. What was it? Clone legion. We don't play profound journey. We don't play five, six, seven, eight mana instants and sorceries. Sometimes we play five mana sorceries. All a rate of that. Um, you know, we play one, two, three, four mana sorceries. So realistically, this guy's going to be a four, four or less, which is okay for four, I guess. Um, you know, if it lives long enough to do some damage, you can get that spell again. Uh, so maybe you get some extra removal out of it. But of course, there's going to be no surprise. Your opponent's going to know precisely what's going to be coming and what's going to be going on. Um, this, this feels a bit too high variance to me. 
uh, game to game because there's no guarantee of what's going to be in your graveyard. Um, you could very well be stuck with this guy just sitting in your hand because there's not something in your graveyard. Um, it, it just seems way too high variance for me to want to take this. Um, I'm going to give it a C-. Um, I'll leave it to somebody else to play. Um, I'll, I'll give it a shot on a Wacky Wednesday video, um, but uh, in a serious actual draft, I, I'm not going to be taking this guy very highly or, or really playing him, so i got to go with C- on him. Next up is Mirror Mockery. This is a one in a blue enchantment aura at rare, and it says Enchant Creature. Whenever Enchanted Creature attacks, you may put a token onto the battlefield that's a copy of that creature. Exile that token at end of combat. Now, don't get pulled into what I was thinking about this card and what a lot of people were thinking about this card. Uh, the token that's created doesn't get haste. The token that's created is not attacking. That means that you're not probably going to be playing this on your own creature. This is meant to be sort of removal, um, kind of sort of removal. You play this on your opponent's creature, so if your opponent's creature attacks, you get a copy of it that just blocks it and trades with it or just bounces off of it if it's a 4-5 you know, or whatever. Um, and, and of course, the, the massive benefit of this is you throw it on uh, a good creature of theirs that has a good enter the battlefield effect, and so your opponent isn't going to want to attack and give you that into the battlefield effect. Now, you could play this on your own creature that has a solid enter the battlefield effect uh, so that you get to you know recur that effect over and over and over. But generally, you're going to want to be playing this as pseudo removal. And it is pretty okay removal still, especially for blue. You know, blue doesn't get flat out removal. They sometimes get exile, but something happens. You know, we... Uh, uh, do a blessed reincarnation or, or we reality shift into a manifest or something like that or we give them a, uh, a bird after countering their spell um, but blue just doesn't get you know that blow up that creature removal they get they get wacky stuff like this um, and this seems okay for blue um, I, I do at least once want to grab this and grab a bunch of end of the battlefield effects and uh, uh, play it on myself and recur some awesome effects but generally this is just going to be uh, fairly okay removal for blue which does give it a, a b minus for me it's a pretty good pick if you're in the blue deck um it, it's gonna buy you some time for sure if you throw this on their bomb or whatever next up we have monastery lore master this is a three and a blue three two creature gin wizard at common and it says megamorph five blue it also says when monastery lore master is turned face up return target non-creature, non-land card from your graveyard to your hand. So instant sorcery, artifact, planeswalker. In limited, we're talking about instant sorceries, basically. Um, you know, this is most likely going to be, uh, by turn six, buying back some sort of removal, which is pretty solid. You know, if this was like a turn four play, it may not be as good. It, it would be something that you would need to hold on to much longer than that because you wouldn't be returning much. You'd be returning maybe a combat trick or, or a, an early game only removal spell. But by turn six, you're going to be getting back Reach of Shadows. You're going to be getting back, you know, good removal. Um, the vanilla stats on this card are pretty middling, but just playable. Um, but the Megamorph stats with the returning probably a removal spell make this card much more playable um it's not amazing you know it's not awesome it's not a high pick in any way shape or form but i do give it a c plus I, i'm gonna i'm gonna not cut this guy far more often than i cut this guy i think so solid c plus for me next up we have mystic meditation this is a three and a blue sorcery at common and it says draw three cards then discard two cards unless you discard a creature card so you discard two, or you discard one creature. So this is uh, pretty similar to Thirst for Knowledge, except much worse. <laughs> so Thirst of Knowledge was, uh, I believe, two and a blue for an instant draw three, discard two, unless you discard an artifact. Uh, so it costs one more, it's sorcery speed, and you have to pitch a creature, which is super, super, super relevant, usually, in limited. Now, the upside, of course, is that you do have a ton of creatures. So you may have 
a, a bad creature that you don't really want on turn four or whenever you cast this game. Um, the bigger issue here for me by far is its sorcery speed. You're going to have to spend four mana, meaning probably your turn, casting this card in order to draw two. So, you know, it's not amazing. It's totally playable still. You know, Divination's always playable at sorcery speed. Um, well, let's not say always playable. It's playable in the right kind of blue decks that want it. And those blue decks would also play this for sure. So I, I'm going to give it a C. Um, if it were instant speed, it would go up. Um, if it, uh, you know, cost less, it would go up. If it was thirst for knowledge, it would go up. Um, but, you know, this is totally playable. Solid C. It's cuttable if you want to cut it. It's not cuttable if you don't want to cut it. So just a solid middle of the road C. Next up, we have Negate. This is a, a very common reprint. It's in almost every core set. It's in a ton of other sets. It's one in a blue instant at common for counter target non creature spell so counter target instant sorcery planeswalker artifact whatever um solid prototypical sideboard card you do not main deck this yes you are go guaranteed to be playing against instants and sorceries guaranteed no it is almost never right to main deck a spell that targets instants and sorceries um don't take it highly don't main deck it uh, but if you come up against a deck that has a Planeswalker, if you come up against a deck that has, you know, a super awesome, rare, back-breaking instant or sorcery, sideboard this in. But uh, don't play this just to, you know, counter a combat trick or something like that. Uh, so this is just a solid sideboard D. Next up is Ojutai Interceptor. This is a 3 and a blue, 3-1 creature bird soldier at common. It has flying. And it has Megamorph for three and a blue. So the Megamorph is the exact same as the cost. Um, this seems fairly good. It's going to be a 4-2 flyer the vast majority of the time. Um, you play this on turn three, get a 2-2 two -two morph. The next turn, pay the cost that you would have paid anyways to just cast it to get a, a plus one plus one counter on it. So you get a 4-2 flyer. 4-2 flyer seems not bad at all to me. Uh, the two is kind of weak, you know. Wild Slash knocks this down. Uh, any other flyer in the air will knock this down. But uh, ideally, when you're attacking in on turn four with this guy, you're going to get in for at least four. So uh, I'm pretty happy with this guy. I think it'll make my deck uh, some percentage of the time. Um, more often than not, I will not cut this. So uh, yeah, just a solid C+. Plus. Just a, a nice uh, French vanilla Megamorph here. Next up is Ojutai's Breath. This is a two and a blue instant at common, and it says tap target creature. It doesn't on tap during its controller's next on tap step. And rebound. So we talked in white about how with tap effects, I like to be able to draw a card off of it if I'm just tapping the creature, or I like to freeze them. And this is freezing them. This is uh, turning them off for an entire turn cycle uh, extra. Plus, you get to rebound it. We've talked about a couple of rebound spells where I've been kind of iffy about if the rebound is actually going to have much value. This, the rebound is always going to have value. Almost always, at least. There's going to be rare cases where it wouldn't. Uh, it just seems extremely solid. You can keep a creature tapped down over multiple turns. So you can uh, tap it down. It doesn't untap during their next untap step. Play your turn out. Uh... It doesn't on tap on their opponent's turn. You get back to your turn. Your rebound happens. You can tap it down again for another full turn cycle. Seems great. Or you could, of course, tap down uh, multiple threats. So you could tap down one and then tap down the other. Uh, you do need to be careful where you cast this, though. Uh, say you cast this at the end of your turn, and they have a single creature down, and you freeze it. You are getting the rebound instantly. You're getting the rebound, you know, in two phases you're going to go to on tap step and then upkeep and rebound is there again and the rebound's not going to do all that much hitting that same target a second time um, so this sometimes wants to be cast during your turn in order to you know, in order to get the uh, uh, the sort of long term freeze on a single target uh, but this is going to be amazing 
when there are multiple creatures on your opponent's board. You play it end step to tap one, you play it upkeep step to on tap the second, uh, and you get in for a bunch of damage over the next possibly two turns. Um, seems like a solid, solid pick for me for every blue deck there is outside of the, uh, you know, the super, super, super control uh, play a turn 12 finisher deck. Uh, but blue tempo, blue aggro is going to love this spell. And this is going to be a relatively high pick for me uh, at B+. Next up is Ojutai Summons. Ojutai Summons is a 3 blue blue sorcery at common. And it says put a 2 2 blue gin monk creature token with flying onto the battlefield and rebound. So for 6 mana or sorry, not six mana, five mana, you're getting a 2-2 two, two blue djinn with flying, and then the next turn you're getting a second one. So you're getting 4-4 four, four flyer for five, which is pretty decent stats. Um, you know, I, I'd prefer a 4-4 four, four flyer as opposed to two 2-2 two, two flyers. Uh, they're not going to be breaking through your opponent's flyer defense uh, as much as a 4-4 four, four would. And it does take two turns for it to happen, so they're a bit more prone to removal or... or just not being fast enough to do anything for you and so overall it just sort of seems like a card that's not special but just kind of playable um i gotta give it a c i i think i will cut it or include it probably an equal amount of the time um it's ever so slightly expensive for me to get two two twos um i prefer i prefer to play pay four to get two two twos uh you know I, i'm paying a cost by splitting that power and toughness up over two but uh yeah i gotta give it just a sort of middle of the road to see i i I'll, I'll need to see how it plays but i think i might even drop that grade over time but we'll see how it plays once uh we all get some experience with it next up is palace familiar this is a one in a blue one one creature bird at common it has flying and it also says when palace familiar dies draw a card so uh, we all know that you don't play 1-1s one for 1, uh, usually anyways. And flying doesn't make it any better. I'm looking at you, Avon Skirmisher. Does drawing a card when it dies give it some extra value and make it playable? Well, you know, kind of slightly. Um, not enough that I'd ever really pick this on purpose, and I, I would never really be happy playing this. But uh, if I need a creature, if I need, you know, that 23rd card and I'm desperate, yeah, I'll play this. Um, it, it, it can get a C- minus from me. It's going to be cut a huge amount of the time. Um, it's obviously a really nice exploit target, um, but I don't know how many mediocre creatures you want to put in your deck just to fuel exploit. Um, I, I'd prefer just to play better creatures um, in almost all cases. So uh, I'm not too sold on this guy. I've got to go with a C-. minus. I do love drawing a card, but... Uh, I just don't think it's that good, unfortunately, so C- minus for me. Next up is Profaner of the Dead. This is a 3 and a blue 3-3 three, three creature Naga wizard at rare, and it says exploit. When Profaner of the Dead exploits a creature, return to their owner's hands all creatures your opponents control with toughness less than the exploited creature's toughness. That is some difficult wording. But basically, you're going to sack a creature of yours and all of your opponent's creatures who have toughness uh, less than, not equal to or less than, but just less than the exploited creature's toughness, bounce back to their hand. So this is kind of weird because you're going to want to be sacking something with high toughness. Generally, something with high toughness is going to be a pretty big creature. You know, you don't want to sack a target of this. Yeah, you could bounce their entire team, but you're also sacking your 8-8 flying bomb. Um, so I don't know, maybe you sack Ancient Carp to this, but then you have to play Ancient Carp, which doesn't sound all that good to me. Um, you could, of course, sack Profaner himself, which means you would bounce back all of their X2s, which seems pretty darn bad. Um, but I, I, I'm just having a hard time kind of evaluating this guy the ability is strong but the cost is high because you're either sacking a pretty important creature or you're playing and wasting a card slot on a high toughness pretty bad creature maybe this guy actually goes into the toughness matters deck 
Um, he, he doesn't necessarily quite look like that offhand, but maybe he does go into that deck specifically. Um, obviously, it's potentially a finisher enabler. You know, even if you have a Tarka down, you sack a Tarka, you bounce their entire team, and you have lethal on board with just your other little guys. But uh, I just don't know. I'm going to have to see this guy get played out, and I'm going to have to see how it works. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remain cautious on it. I'm going to give it a C+. Plus. Um, I don't necessarily want to be the guy that tests this uh, uh, guy on the battlefield, but uh, I have to see how it works. I, I, I could see this being all over the board. I could see this being significantly lower than my grade. I could see this being uh, a fair bit higher than my grade, but uh, I'm going to go with a cautious C+, plus until I get more experience with this guy. Next up, we have Carsey Deceiver. Carsey Deceiver is a 1 and a blue 0 4 creature Naga Wizard at Uncommon, and it says tap, add one to your mana pool, so one colorless. Spend this mana only to cast a face-down creature spell, pay a mana cost to, to turn a manifested creature face up, or pay a megamorph, or sorry, a morph cost. Uh, a megamorph cost is also a morph cost, by the way. So this is interesting. It's a uh, you know, it's no secret plans, it's no trail of mystery, but it uh, helps the face down deck do some stuff, uh, but doesn't quite make up for it. Secret plans and trail of mystery made uh, the face down decks really, really fun and really, really uh, uh, higher powered. This doesn't do a whole lot. Um, if there is a blue based morph manifest deck, then this guy will have some utility in it, uh, you know, especially being at two mana. So he's not taking up the morph slot, which is fantastic. But uh, it'll remain, remain to be seen if he's any good um, in that specific archetype. Um, because outside of that archetype, he's not going to do very much for you. Maybe he goes into the, uh, the mystical Toughness Matters deck. But uh, I've got to give him a D plus just because of uh, how narrow he is. If you're full-on all-in Morph Manifest, then yeah, maybe this guy's got some value to you. But outside of that one single deck, I just don't see this being all that good. So I've got to go with D+. Next up, we have Reduce in Stature. This is a two and a blue enchantment aura at common, and it says Enchant Creature. Enchanted Creature has base power and toughness, O2. So you turn off creatures, you turn off bombs, you turn huge guys, huge, awesome creatures into boring little O2s. Now, very, very, very important. Keep in mind, this does not erase abilities. So your big, giant creatures that have big, giant abilities are going to be boring little creatures that still have big, giant abilities. So, you know, be very careful. It could still be a very dangerous O2 that you're looking at on the other side of the board. That being said, this still is a great piece of uh, non-premium removal. It's a great piece of uh, blue removal. So uh, until I learn otherwise from playing with it, I'm going to draft it pretty highly and play it all the time. So, uh, you know, it gets a B plus for me. I think it's I think it's just solid, arguably one of the best blue commons in the set. Next up, we have Shore Crasher Elemental. This is a blue, 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 3-3, three, three, creature elemental at Mythic. It's got a whole bunch of text. It says, pay blue, exile Shore Crasher Elemental, then return it to the battlefield face down under its owner's control. So it returns as a morph. Or you can pay one colorless to give Shore Crasher Elemental plus one, minus one, or minus one, plus one until end of turn. So it's a bit of a, uh, a morphling, aetherling thing going on here. And you can megamorph it for four and a blue. So it's a four, four if you uh, megamorph it. So this is, uh, this is really interesting. Aetherling was really awesomely good. But what was the best about Aetherling was that it had the, uh, the unblockable ability. So you could pump it, make it huge, make it unblockable, and just do a whole bunch of damage. This guy's a bit less good because he doesn't have that unblockable. Um, and honestly, it doesn't feel mythic to me. Um, Aetherling was rare. This seems a little bit worse than Aetherling. I don't quite get why this is mythic. It feels like a rare to me. Um, but this thing does still essentially have, have Hexproof. You know, 
pay a blue. This thing has hexproof. You get it back uh, morphed, which is kind of a pain because you're going to have to unmorph it. Uh, it's not manifested, so you can't just pay blue, blue, blue to flip it up. You do have to pay the full five. Um, and so that means it does have this sort of vulnerable phase where it's just a little, you know, two, two colorless morph creature. Um, as well, the blue, blue, blue is going to be a tough casting cost. Um, you can just avoid that casting cost, of course, by morphing and mega morphing it, but you're going to have that vulnerable period. Now, after the flip, this guy can be as big as a 7-1 or, or as fat as an 0-8 which is pretty big to me, um, and that does make this feel like a bomb to me. It, it's in bomb range, but the lack of evasion is going to keep it a little bit low for me. So I'm going to put it at an A-. minus. Um, this has a ton of constructed uh, potential in it. Uh, Mono Blue Devotion might come back, who knows. In Limited, it's a little bit weaker, though. Um, so I've got to go with A- minus on this. I, I'm interested in playing it. I'm interested in seeing how it plays out. Um, but I'm curious just how good it happens to be uh, in the limited uh, environment. Next up, we have Sidisi's Faithful. This is a single blue 04 creature Naga wizard at common. And it says exploit. When Sidisi's Faithful exploits a creature, return target creature to its owner's hand. So I've already mentioned this. Uh, exploit feels like manifest to me uh, in this set. And what I mean, if you're not familiar with this, is I was very unsure about manifest in, during my uh, Fate Reforged set review. Uh, I was very unsure about how powerful it would be, how often you'd be able to flip it up, um, and I really needed to play with it to see how it was. Um, and exploit feels the same way to me. I, I need to see how exploit plays out. Uh, there's absolutely some awesome exploit abilities in the set, but there are a whole lot that I look at and I just kind of ask myself, is sacking a creature really worth getting these single turn effects, like bouncing a creature back to their hand? I love bouncing creatures back to their hand, but I don't know if it's worth a creature. Now, of course, you can try to build around exploit by getting a whole bunch of, uh, uh, you know, when this creature dies effects, getting in uh, Young Scholar, as we'll see in Sidisi, or not Sidisi, uh, uh, Saltai Emissary, and... Uh, maybe even Palace Familiar, things like that. But I don't know how much you want to play potentially mediocre creatures just to get the exploit abilities out of them. Um, so, you know, this guy kind of hurts because I love the ability. I don't love paying a creature for it. So, you know, I've got to go with a C- minus on this. There is the potential upside that this is basically uh, a single blue bounce spell because you could just sack itself and bounce the creature, the downside is that it's sorcery speed. Sorcery speed bounce, not generally as good as instant speed bounce because it's less versatile. You're going to be bouncing primarily to get damage through as opposed to uh, bouncing as a tempo play. Uh, so I'm going to go with C- minus on this. Uh, I'm going to need to play with it. I'm going to need to play with exploit as a whole to really get a feel on it. This could go higher. This could stay the same. I don't think it'll go lower, though, so uh, I'm going to go with C- minus on it. Next up is Sight Beyond Sight. Sight Beyond Sight is a three and a blue sorcery at Uncommon, and it says look at the top two cards of your library. Put one of them into your hand and the other on the bottom of your library, and then rebound. So this is basically a fancy divination for uh, an extra mana. Um, I really, really, really hate that it's sorcery speed. Um, a lot of the spells in this blue... Uh, uh, Dragons of Tarkir set are sorcery speed and that hurts my soul I like my draw to be instant at their end step um, sorcery speed means you are tending to take an entire turn off to draw these cards um, at least the second time around you're not paying for it um, but you are essentially scrying two and drawing one um, each turn uh, you know, which is pretty nice. You know, doing it twice is twice is nice. Um, it, it's probably playable. It's not amazing. The sorcery speed really, really hinders it. So I do have to go with a C plus at best. Um, if this was instant, it would be much higher. But at sorcery speed, I've got to go with a, a C plus on this. I'll cut it some amount of the time. I'll play it if I'm playing, you know, sort of a tempo deck or uh, uh, something that wouldn't mind playing this on turn four. Something that wouldn't mind taking a turn off to draw cards. Next up is Silumgar Sorcerer. This is a 1 blue blue 2-1 creature human wizard at uncommon. And it has flash. It has flying. It has exploit. And it says when Silumgar Sorcerer exploits a creature, 
counter target creature spell. Well, now this is a, an exploit card that uh, I, don't, I don't think I need to play with to get a feel on it. Uh, countering a spell is probably worth a creature. Uh, this is basically an essence scatter for one more blue, sacking a creature, but you get a 2-1 flyer in replacement for it. Um, you know, this guy is a total include in most control, grindy blue decks, maybe even in tempo, uh, maybe even in aggro, uh, you know, because you do get the 2-1 flyer out of it. So you get to kind of get a little bit of control mixed in with your aggro. Um, I, I still need to play with exploit to really get a true handle on it, but I don't think I need to uh, be as concerned about this guy. I think this guy's just solid. I, I, I give him a B-, minus. he's not a bomb, he's not a... You know, going to end the game in any way, shape, or form, but he's a solid, solid, solid utility creature. Um, pairing this with a creature that you're going to get some bonus out of uh, sacking is uh, going to make it even better. So I'm pretty happy with this guy. I gave him the B-. minus. He's going to be in uh, most of the blue decks that I play, and he's going to be a relatively high pick, too. Next up is Silimgar Spell Eater. This is a 2 and a blue, 2, 3 creature Naga Wizard at Uncommon. It has Megamorph for 4 and a blue. And it says, when Silimgar Spell Eater is turned face up, counter target spell unless its controller pays three. Well, this is Mana Leak on a body. This is my, uh, my channel's namesake. Uh, but the question is, how good is a turn five Mana Leak? Historically, not the best. Uh, unfortunately, Mana Leak is the best on turns two through four, where your opponent is not going to be able to pay the three. Yeah, absolutely, you'll sometimes catch their bomb where they tap out for it or they nearly tap out for it. But as the game goes later, Mana Leak gets worse and worse and worse. So unless you're flipping this guy up on curve, so on four, on four blue, so on turn five, and catching their five drop or something like that, this guy's going to be kind of weak. Now you are going to catch them somewhat enough to make this playable and make this not always cuttable so i do give it a c plus but you do need to be careful and you do need to be aware that you're probably only going to catch them once if they're a good player and they get caught in game one by this thing in game two if you have a morph sitting on the board they're not going to play their bomb until they have three mana extra so just be aware of that or they're going to just you know, aggressively to kill your morph off. Uh, so be aware of that. You know, it, it's not the best of counter spells. Um, you know, it, this is no Karu spell snatcher, but uh, you'll still get some value out of it. You'll still get some surprises, especially in game one. So it's enough that I do give it a C plus. It's enough that uh, uh, I consider it uh, not cuttable more than cuttable. So C plus for me on this, but not a high pick. Next up is Silimgar's Scorn. This is a blue-blue instant at Uncommon, and it says and as an additional cost to cast Silimgar's Scorn, you may reveal a dragon card from your hand. Counter target spell unless its controller pays one. If you revealed a dragon card or controlled a dragon as you cast Silimgar's Scorn, counter that spell instead. So just flat out counter it. There's no ability for your opponent to get back. So counter spells back, kind of, Sometimes, slightly, in limited, maybe a little bit, sort of. Um, so in limited, this without a dragon is awful. You know, the the, the scenario that you're going to want to be doing is playing this on their on-curve drop where they tap out for it. Um, and, and after the mid-game, that's probably just not going to happen. You know, they're going to have that one mana. They're going to be casting five drops with six mana and things like that. Um, if you have some dragons, it gets quite a bit better. Um, but I'm super worried about the consistent th consistency there. You know, we've talked about my concern about the dragons. I don't think you're going to be playing too many of the uncommon ones, which means that you're going to expect to have a dragon in your deck generally. Uh, and as I said, if you go all in dragons, I think you might be making a mistake. So I'm not sure how consistently you're going to be able to actually make this into a counter spell. Um, so I'm going to be really cautious on this. I'm going to give it a D plus. Um, I could be wrong, but I don't think so. I just I don't think the reveal a dragon clause is going to be consistent enough for you to uh, rely on it happening. It's going to be good when it happens, but I don't think it's cons consistent enough to actually uh, uh, be a thing. 
Next up, we have Skywise Teaching. This is a three and a blue enchantment at Uncommon, and it says whenever you cast a non-creature spell, you may pay one blue. Sorry, that's one and a blue. So one colorless plus a blue. If you do, put a 2-2 blue Jin monk creature token with flying onto the battlefield. So, um, you know, we've talked about prowess and fake prowess and how I don't necessarily care for it um, because you're not going to be playing that many non-creature spells to really justify it. Uh, on turn four, I'd rather be establishing my board rather than playing a, an enchantment that does nothing until later. Uh, in a creature light deck, I could see this doing something. You know, over time, you're going to be making 2-2 flyers, which, you know, that's it's not the worst. But, uh, you know, kind of ask yourself, how often did you play Goblin Slide, and did it work out for you? Generally not. Uh, and I don't think making this slightly more expensive just to get 2-2 flyers out of it is going to be all that much better. Uh, so I've got to give this a C-. minus. I can see some people going all in on it and having some fun with it. But I don't see it being competitive. I don't see it being uh, something that I really want to include uh, basically ever. So yeah, C- minus probably should be even lower. But uh, I'm going to keep it there for the fun aspect that could come out of it. Next up is Stratus Dancer. This is a 1 and a blue 2-1 creature Jin Monk at rare. It has flying and it has megamorph for one and a blue as well. So the casting cost is the megamorph cost. And it says when Stratus Dancer is turned face up, counter target instant or sorcery spell. Uh, I, I like this quite a bit. It's not a bomb by any stretch. It's just a very solid value utility creature. Uh, Welkin Turn was great. Um, uh, Vaporkin was great. Those were 2-1 flyers for 2. And they could only block flyers. Um, this can block whatever it wants. And, uh, you know, it gains the ability to be morphed. Uh, on morph, maybe spoil a combat trick or removal spell. And become a 3-2 flyer, which is, uh, you know, pretty darn good. I think this is probably first pickable. Um, it's not windmill first pickable. It's not going to be pickable over premium removal, but I think it's pretty solid, and it's going to go in every blue deck I play. Um, I, I'd be pretty happy to have this guy. I do give it a B plus. Uh, as I said, not a bomb by any sort of the imagination. Don't take it over premium removal, but uh, take it and be happy with it in most of the packs that you'll see. Next up is Tygum's Strike. This is three and a blue sorcery at common. It says target creature gets plus two plus O oh until end of turn and can't be blocked this turn. And rebound. So uh, this seems slightly expensive to me. Um, plus two plus O oh is okay. Making it unblockable, yeah, I guess that needs to be costed a little bit high. Um, you know, it, it does seem like a way to immediately finish the game in a lot of cases too. You know, you throw this on your you know, 4-4 four, four, whatever on the ground, make it a 6-4 that can't be blocked. You're getting in for 6, probably guaranteed damage. Um, so, you know, I, I guess the 4 mana is kind of worth it. And you get it a second time, so if you're really lucky, you get in 2 unblockable uh, uh, hits with it. So I think aggro decks are going to be pretty happy with this. Uh, maybe tempo decks. I could see playing this. It's going to be interesting. I, I need to play with this. This could be the Teamer Battle Rage, really, for this set for me. Uh, I was down on Teamer Battle Rage in the Fate Reforged set review, and I was wrong with that. Uh, uh, it was pretty good, and decks that uh, had it used it to pretty good effect, and I could see this being kind of the same. So I'm going with perhaps an overcautious C+. I could see this maybe even being bumped up to B minus. I've I've kind of talked myself into it just right now, um, but I'm going to go with C plus and be a slightly cautious on this one. Next up is Updraft Elemental. This is a two and a blue one four creature elemental at common with flying, and that is all. Seems bad to me. Um, you know, we've talked about the toughness matters deck. Perhaps this is where it's supposed to go. It's supposed to go in that Toughness Matters deck, uh, which I promise we'll get to. It's going to take a few days to get to the green, but we'll get to the Toughness Matters deck uh, enabler. Um, I don't know if that's going to be a deck because it's going to require a rare. So it's going to be a build around from pack one, pick one. It's not going to be a, a, a start building with commas and on commas and hope you get it kind of thing, or else you're going to be very sad. Um, I think this is just completely unplayable outside of it. I, I don't want a 1-4 flyer. You know, yeah, it blocks stuff, but I prefer to be doing stuff. So I'm going to give this a D plus. Um, yeah, we'll see if the toughness deck actually uh, comes out of anything. 
Next up, we have Void Squall. This is four and a blue sorcery at uncommon, and it says return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand and rebound. So as we talked about on Sidisi's, uh, on Sidisi's what? Sidisi's Faithful? Yeah, Sidisi's Faithful. Uh, I love bounce. I love bouncing things back to their owner's hand. I love tempo plays, but I like them at one and a blue and at instant. Definitely not four and a blue and sorcery. The fact that it rebounds and I can hit another creature or just hit the creature that I bounced the first time around is kind of cool. Um, but I don't want to pay five mana for it. I don't want to do it at sorcery speed. Um, I don't want to do it on my turn. So uh, I just can't get on this, really. Uh, I've got to give it a C-. minus. I'm going to cut it a lot of the time. It is no, uh, you know, no normal bounce. It's not on summon. It's not the good type of bounce spell. So I'm going to be pretty hard on this one. I'm going to give it a C-. minus. I'm going to cut it probably a whole lot of the time. Next up is Youthful Scholar. This is 3 and a blue, 2-2, two, two, Creature Human Wizard at Uncommon. And it says, when Youthful Scholar dies, draw two cards. So it's uh, it's Palace Familiar, but twice and four times as much. Um, you know, it, it still seems fairly solid, though. Four mana is a little bit much for a 2-2, two, two, but getting a Divination out of the deal when it dies is pretty good. Uh, I'm all for playing this guy in a lot of blue decks. Uh, Controly decks are going to love it, because this will die and they'll get some card advantage over their opponents. Aggro decks will love it, because they can just swing in with him. Eventually he'll die and they'll get to refill their hands a little bit with a couple of cards. Uh, I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of this guy. I, I'm going to give him a B-. He's, he's going to be a relatively high pick for me. He's not going to be first pick. Um, you know... Uh, I would be pretty sad if he was my first pick in a pack. Um, he's not going to be second or maybe third pick, but he's going to be still pretty high, and he's going to be in basically every blue deck I play. So uh, a B- minus from him, I love getting cards. He'd be an awesome exploit target as well. Uh, just pretty happy with this guy overall. So yeah, B-. minus. All right, the last card of this blue set review is Zephyr Scribe. It is two and a blue for a 2-1 creature human monk at common. And it says, pay a blue, tap, draw a card, then discard a card. So you get to loot. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, so fake Browse, untap Zephyr Scribe. So this is, uh, I don't know, I guess it's a fixed version of Merfolk Looter. Uh, Merfolk Looter is where the term looting comes from. It's a, a one and a blue, one, one, uh, where you tap it and you get to draw a card, then discard a card. So this kind of, uh, it does a whole bunch of things to weaken that. It makes you pay for it. You have to pay a blue to loot. You don't just get to tap it. It uh, costs three instead of two. You get an extra power out of it, but this guy's not really meant to be attacking all that much, um, especially not when he comes down on turn three. That being said, looting is awesome. Paying a blue for looting is totally fine. Um, drawing a card and discarding a card is really, really, really powerful. Um, it's super useful. The fake prowess effect is pretty ignorable for me. I don't, I don't really care that that's on there. I'm not even really reading it. Um, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll get to loot and then cast a removal spell and then loot again if you want to. Uh, and that'll be pretty fun, but it's going to come up relatively rarely, honestly. Um, I, I'm just happy to have this guy as a looter. I'd prefer him to be a merfolk looter, be, you know, slightly cheaper. I don't really care about that 2-1. I don't think I'm going to be attacking with him all that much on, you know, turn three four or later when he'll be on the battlefield without summoning sickness but uh he, he's just a good old-fashioned looter and and that's totally includable and rarely cuttable so uh, i give him a c plus i'll take him pretty gladly not highly um and i'll pretty gladly include him most of the time so yeah that's the blue set review done blue's looking pretty interesting uh there are some great cards in there icefall regent i'm super excited to play with shore crasher elemental um, a whole lot of Bs and B pluses, some surprisingly good removal or, or pseudo removal for blue. Uh, I'm pretty excited by it. I, I'm definitely looking forward to playing it. Um, I, I'm looking forward to getting my hands on Exploit, if only to get some information about it and really sort of feel how it plays. Um, but yeah, that's that's it for the blue set review. As always, if you have any questions, comments, suggestions, definitely let me know in the comments below. You can also find me on Twitter at the Manaleek. That's L E E K, like the vegetable, not the card. You can also find me on Facebook at facebook.com/slash/themanaleek, and links for those are in the show notes. You've already found me here on YouTube. You should definitely uh, like the videos if you like them. Click that little thumbs up icon. 
and also subscribe to my channel. That'll let you know as soon as the next set review video is up. That'll let you know as soon as the, uh, you know, the regular schedule is back on Wacky Wednesdays and Spiky Saturdays and any other videos that I might upload. And of course, that lets me reach more subscribers as well. Uh, the subscribe button is by the show information, and there's also a, a handy little subscribe button in the outro if you stick around for my... Uh, uh, my outro once this is done. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, comments, suggestions, let me know. Otherwise, I will see you all tomorrow for the Black Set Review.